Hello everyone and welcome to the Eltons. We are really happy to be here with you. I am Ashlesha Rodriguez de Souza, and with me I have my colleague Catherine. And we are here to present to you our session on what you didn't know about online learning. A little about myself. I am the content delivery lead with English Online, British Council's premium online learning platform for adults. And I'm responsible for creating content for teaching and for learning so that it's best delivered online, making it engaging for all of our learners. I'll hand it over to Catherine to tell you a little bit about herself. Thank you, Ash. Hello, everyone. I am the Teaching Excellence Lead at English Online. This means that I'm responsible for teaching quality in our virtual classroom. In other words, I make sure that materials created by Ash's team are used well. So let us begin. By the way, at any time, if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat and we'll pick them up later. In education, there's always this temptation to go with our hunch. Why not? We can use our professional experience, qualifications, other people's advice. And yet, it's also very important to develop the habit of looking at the data. So, for this talk, Ash and I have decided to ask you a few simple questions. Let's begin the poll. Let's look at the results. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't say that the results are surprising, would you? It seems that most of the people here, and it feels like most people around the world now, have had some experience of learning or studying or maybe teaching online. It's good and bad. Good because we are already very familiar with studying online. And bad could be because some of those experiences may not have, have been 100% positive. Well, let's look a bit deeper into this. Let's look at the second poll question. Great, let's look at the results. Mm hmm. Wonderful. More than half of you like that you can learn online because it's available 24 by 7. So let's say at 3 a.m. in the morning, you might get a wish to study a bit of English grammar and you can do it in many situations. Wonderful. It does save you time and money. Commuting, of course, is a big pain point for face to face education and it is very much accessible to everyone. Now, by the way, if you have selected other, feel free to pop your thoughts and comments into the chat as well. We'll be happy to see what you think. Let's look at the third question. Thank you very much. Let's look at the results. Mm, interesting. I'm a bit surprised, actually, that so many of you have selected no social connection. There is online learning and online learning. I hope that Ash and I will be able to persuade you that there are types of online learning that can actually help you build a lot of new social connections. Long and boring classes and yes, tech issues are still a big pain point. Interesting, and to some extent expected, I think, because Ash and I and many other colleagues that we have, have had similar thoughts, especially in the early days of teaching and working online. And this is exactly what some of our students may have felt before when they joined our courses. But today, we are hoping to show you that there are a lot of advantages to online learning that you didn't know about or didn't consider so much. Over to you, Ash. So let's look at the online learning landscape. We are quite spoiled for choice. Just give me a minute. The slides seem to be running away from me. Yeah. 
So we're really quite spoiled for choice. Uh, we have apps, we have uh, games, we have a whole host of courses. Some of them are teacher-led, some of them are self-access, some of them are massive online courses with forums. We have information at our fingertips with videos and audio, which you can just watch. You have online tutorials. Um, there's VR, which can actually take you into a situation and have you experience it while you practice. And of course, not to forget AI. AI has really changed the learning landscape. Uh, we have AI to help you practice, AI to help you, you know, draw images and talk about it, AI to help you write and get feedback. There's a ton of things out there. The problem is, how do you decide? How do you decide what's best for you? How do you decide what's going to help you to learn and achieve your goals in a specific amount of time? It's not easy when you have so much to choose from. And one advice that we can give you is look at what you don't like first. One big pain point that you also mentioned in the survey uh, that prevents people from committing to an online course is that classes can be quite long and boring. We've all been in this situation. Imagine you have to be in a 60 minute, 90 minute, 120 minute class. And if you have to sit two hours in front of a computer screen, that becomes a bit of a drag. Let me describe the situation to you. You're starting a lesson, you begin in a positive way you have a chat with other students then the teacher welcomes you and you have a bit of grammar some practice activities then you start writing and then you check the answers together then you write again you check answers you write again you check answers and you realize that the energy goes downhill and that's just the middle of the lesson so we questioned this approach why not move some of these activities that are really important but not always very engaging to the pre-class part of your studies out of the live class so what would happen is you would begin with the rules and some practice of those rules you could even do some long reading and listening tasks before you join the live class this is similar to how the flipped classroom works, if you're familiar with it, and it works even better online. You can lay down the foundation for your knowledge and skills before the live class. Then you practice in class in real life situations, and you can do it quite creatively under the guidance of an experienced teacher. Sometimes you can even get some physical objects into your screen and you can do some physical movements and all in all it can be very engaging and fun and then after the live class you do a little bit of revision like this you get the best of the both worlds you work with the teacher you study language and at the same time classes are not so long and boring instead of 90 or 120 minutes you can study let's say for 55 minutes The next pain point that we would like to tell you about is related to how you feel when you study online in front of a computer and you don't seem to see other people. Some people actually have said in the survey, and we've heard other people say before, that studying online can bring about this awful feeling of social isolation. After all, how can you meet new people sitting at your desk or lying on the sofa? But then again, let's consider how live classes can help you build those connections. Nowadays, with all the edtech development, there are loads of apps and um, tools that can help the teacher arrange breakout rooms for you. And then you can have all kinds of different types of interaction. Let's say, for example, you have a task of um, planning a 
party with your friend. So the teacher can put you together with another student. You discuss how to plan the party. Then the teacher puts you very quickly together with another pair and you discuss this together and you pick the best ideas from your brainstorming. And then the teacher puts you into an even bigger group and you choose the best ideas. It's a very, very simple English language learning activity called a pyramid discussion, but it's never been as easy to do as it is to do online. It's really, really quick and easy. One more thing that people sometimes mention they are not sure how they can talk to strangers. They are feeling a bit shy, so they don't want to join group classes. And they're not sure that online classes can help with that. But actually, if you think about it, the fact that you're using tech gives you a lot of control over your environment. If you're not feeling like talking to many people, you can take a break. You can switch off your camera for some time. And this absence of physical connection means that you're amazingly safe. This can never be possible in any other environment. And last but not least, when you meet so many people from around the world, you get a lot of support from people like you that can also be shy or can be eager to make new connections and contacts. And even such a simple activity as asking what the time is where you are or what's the weather like where you are can be really amazing because that person could be from the other side of the world. Say so you can be actually quite surprised if you join a class like this. Another important thing that you need to look at when you are deciding what's best for your learning is the material. The material is so important in giving you that engaging learning experience that makes it not so boring, that helps you not just sit there like a passive learner. Come COVID, yes, we went online really quickly. We didn't have much of a choice there. A lot of the material was scanned and shared on screens, even material from magazines and books, course books, that was the best way to go then. But we've come a long way from COVID now. And there are many different ways of doing things. Uh, scanned material, need I say more? Besides the really small print, which makes it really hard to read, um, it's not something that is meant to be delivered or used in an online class. In a physical classroom, maybe, yes, but not online. There's so much of a choice out there to deliver materials differently. Let's look at an example. Like Catherine said, reading and listening, these are individual activities. You don't need to do this with someone else. So look for courses that put these kind of things, this input material, as we call it, in your pre-class, before your lesson. This way you can engage this with this material by yourself, take as much time as you need with it. And if this material comes to you along with a few exercises, in our experience, that is really engaging for students. The, the little exercises can be small, little multiple choice or comprehension exercises, which help you understand the text better. Sometimes it might help you to draw out little grammar points, which you don't notice when you're reading because you read to understand. And with those grammar points and with that language that you learn through these tiny little gui guided activities, you are better able to go to your class with a little more prep preparation and engage with learners from around the world and use that language and that grammar and practice it you know, in different real life situations that your teacher organizes for you in class. Uh, this way, you're actually bringing real life into the classroom, but you're practicing in a safe space, yet with the diversity of all your peers. This is something you should look for and that expert teacher can give you feedback. In our experience, students love this. It's something they really crave and they love getting feedback on this emergent language that they are practicing uh, in class. 
you also have different learning apps and online tools that sometimes teachers can use within the classroom, within the online classroom. So it's exciting to do something like a competition where you are uh, challenged to think about words and vocabulary, or maybe you do a presentation and you use uh, your phone as a little clicker to change slides, something we're doing right now, which makes it really interesting for us as well. And uh, you leave the class feeling not exhausted, but quite refreshed and having learned something. Another little bit about materials. Uh, many a time people think that you can, you know, especially teachers just turn up to class with whatever, you know, they feel like teaching in a particular day. That's not something that an online course should have. It's good if your online course is structured. There is a start and an end. There are fixed goals and objectives for every lesson and the course in its entirety. When I say structured, it shouldn't mean rigid. It shouldn't be that you must go from point A to point B without steering away from the path. It's important that your online course gives you flexibility. Today, I am uh, in a particular job and presentations are really important for me. Oh, but Tomorrow, I might want to look at a new job and maybe it's interviews that I want to practice. So you should be able to have that power of choice and choose whatever it is you need at that point to help you in your communication, to help you progress. So look for a structured syllabus, preferably one that aligns to the CEFR, which is the Common European Reference Framework, which tells you the levels that you need to go to, go through rather, to reach uh, a competency that helps you in your line of work. Um, when it comes to this, yes, you need to understand where you are and where you need to be. How do you do that? When there's so much to choose, we come right back to the start of our presentation. How do you even know where you are? And so, you know, how are you going to choose what you do next? There is a lot to choose from, yes. But remember, with an online class, there is a lot of data. And yes, your data should be taken, it should be kept private, and it should be used just for you. The data and the patterns generated by it should, use, should be used for personalization. In our experience, students share their motivations uh, with us, and it's important that we use those motivations wisely to recommend and suggest uh, things that they can do next. Now, this can happen with a machine. A machine can recommend and suggest what you do next and what path you go down. But there should be a little red flag that comes up when this happens. Don't let it take away your power of choice. A machine does not know what's right for you. Yes, it can recommend, it can give you suggestions, but you need to choose. You need to decide where you want to go. And sometimes a live class with a teacher, uh, if not with the whole group, a private class maybe, one-on-one, -on -one, which you can have online, uh, it really works. In our experience, students come to live classes, live private classes with the teacher. They tell them, this is what we need. How do we get here? How do I ace this presentation? How do I do well in this exam? And the teacher is there to listen to them, to support them, and then to guide them down the right path. So in online learning, remember, there is a lot of choice, but your course should give you that type of personalization and personalized learning. You can't take the teacher out of learning. It's at the heart of what, it, what learning is and what our learning is all about. So to recap, online learning has been around for several decades now, and it has changed a lot from the years of early experiments to COVID emergency online learning and to great examples of varied best practice in ELT and also in the wider educational landscape. 
So this is what Ash and I wanted to show you about this new model of online learning that has evolved a little bit with our help that we really, really love. First of all, a structured but not rigid learning design where live classes are short and energetic. Second, there's a lot of interaction and there's a lot of collaboration between you and the other students and the teacher. Third, there are convenient and very well made, specifically made for studying online resources that you can use in your own time on any device, anytime and anywhere. With all the technological advances and also with machine learning tempered with human feedback and your own power of choice, online learning has become really accessible, more accessible than ever in terms of time, in terms of physical distance, in terms of culture, and also in terms of learning gains. Say, don't miss your chance. And now it would be good to hear from you what you think. Let's look at the questions and comments in the chat. Ash, do you want to take the first one? Just open the Q&A, give me a minute. So we have a question from Mohammed who says online and physical learning both play an important role in teaching and learning. But unfortunately, there is a lack of knowledge and understanding of using online platforms. So my question is how to control the learners using online resources other than for learning? Mm. Would you like to take that, Catherine? Actually, I was thinking, what a good question. Hmm. Um, you know, you have to accept sometimes that you're dealing with human beings and there are always distractions. So controlling probably is not the best way to go around it. How about encouraging them to take part in your class fully? How about giving them such engaging tasks, such exciting and meaningful tasks that they have no temptation to look into their phone and go on Facebook? I think that's the key. And I'd just like to add something here, mm. whether you like it or not, in a physical classroom or in an online classroom, you're going to have learners who are far, far away from where you want them to be. I think it's also changing the activities and varying, you know, what you do in class. I remember time, Catherine, that I was teaching a class and a simple thing like a QR code, just making them use their phones to do something mm. else other than, you know, look on Facebook actually brought them all back to class. It was really something simple just to go, have them scan a code and do an activity, but they loved it. And with teenagers, that really worked. Have them use their phones for something more productive. Good idea. Or we can have them use the clicker and change our presentation <laughs> slides. Okay. Right. Do you want to take the next one and then I'll take the one Super. after? How is it possible for a teacher to know about their learners? Uh, how is it possible for any teacher to know about learners? It's it's not easy because learners come from a, di a diverse set of backgrounds with different requirements. In our experience in an online class, we have learners in at different stages of their learning that come to class. So our teachers don't often have the same set of learners, you know, for more than one class. How can they know? I think it's important that a teacher is someone who has a discussion in class. It's in an online class, it shouldn't be just input, 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 a teacher talk and you listen. They should ask questions. Learners should be able to share. It's very easy to understand where they're coming from, to read faces. You know, you have just this much, but there's a lot that you can see from someone's expression. And I think as an online teacher, myself it is you get you know that part of you is honed that ability to read and to listen to someone's tone of voice and understand what they mean i think that makes you know a, a good online teacher should be able to do that and you know that comes with online learning absolutely but can i be a bit of a devil's advocate for this yeah. one in <laughs> fact 
good teaching skills do not really depend on whether you teach face to face or online. And we have wonderful online teachers who used to be face to face teachers and then transitioned, but they were able to transfer a lot of their psychological approach and a lot of their skills from face to face teaching to online teaching. All right, let me take the next question. What happens when you have 20 or 30 students in your class at once? How can you give attention to each of them without any of them feeling ignored? I think it's a very good question and it certainly depends on the type of product and the type of course that you're choosing. In fact, at English Online, there are private classes with just one student in the classroom and there are grammar webinars that can be attended by 500 people at once. And it all depends on the teacher's methodology and also on the objective that you are supposed to reach by the end of this class. So let's say I'm a teacher who has to teach 10 to 15 to 20 students in a regular 55 minute class. I have a lot of tools at my disposal. First of all, I need to make sure that my students can speak a lot with each other. So you would probably see some breakout rooms with different groups. You would be paired with one student, then another, then another. And all the time, the teacher will be moving from one breakout room to another to support the students, to see what they're doing, maybe type some comments in the chat, help them with some vocabulary, make some corrections. Then there would be another change of the mode of interaction. You would have an open class discussion and the pace could be quite quick. But at the same time, a well-managed classroom can really very easily accommodate from 10 to 20 people. If you have 500 people in the webinar, then of course the modes of interaction will be different. So you could, for example, give a grammar explanation and then you can interact with the listeners in a different way. You can ask them to do a poll. You can ask them to write yes or no in the comments and you could give them some self access practice tasks as well. And very importantly, at the end of the webinar, you need to have a self check test and you can tell them I'm not letting you out of the virtual classroom until you answer my questions correctly. Well, I can see Ash smiled at this, but um, I'm not sure if everyone would like this joke. What is important, though, is that whatever format of the class you're choosing, the teacher needs to know the format well and manage the classroom according to the objectives of this lesson format. Great, thanks, Kat. I move to the next question. Can self-study help you improve too, or would you advocate mainly for online classes? Um, in our experience, uh, there are some learners who prefer completely self-study modes of learning. Um, this is because they don't have the time. Uh, they like to split their learning up into bite-sized pieces and you know do it in their own time. Um, like I said earlier about materials, there are materials and there are good materials. You can have materials that you can engage with and maybe it's followed by an activity that helps you draw out the learning from a text or from an audio. Uh, it's something that helps you look at it from a different perspective. Your activities, your self-access uh, exercises should be such that they allow you to do this. They should guide you into learning and help you not just learn, but learn how to learn. And this can happen with simple things like, you know, a right and a wrong and a little explanation about why something is wrong you know, or the ability to try again if you get something wrong. So the more attempts you have, uh, the more you are able to understand and work out why something is wrong. And when you've done that and gone through that process, the retention is much, much higher. And that works for some. And, you know, people like it. Uh, whereas others want that connect with the teacher. And so they do a combination of self-access, plus online, and that also works. So in our opinion, it's what you need and what works for you. That's what makes the best of online learning. Absolutely. I totally agree with that as well. 
Um, the next question is um, from Muhammad Asim Subhan. In physical teaching and learning, teachers can see and observe students. But in online teaching learning process, teachers won't be able to look and see their students. How is it possible for teachers to judge and evaluate students' emotions and feelings? Thank you for this question. Um, actually, it is a bit of a misconception that uh, is expressed here because it's only when you make the transition from the face-to-face -face environment to the online teaching and learning environment that you feel that you don't get enough information about how students feel. Our teachers are quite good at it and it's enough for them just to see the face of the student to be able to gauge their reactions to see how the face moves to see whether they smile whether they you know look at the camera or at what you're showing them or they're distracted a lot of the skills that teachers develop face to face can be transferred but this has to be worked through eventually every teacher who likes teaching online will develop this new skill of understanding the students emotions but as I said, in the first weeks or months, some of the teachers may be focusing too much on the tech. They may try to look at their slides all the time. They may try to bring in all the apps around the internet just to make sure that their students are engaged. But whatever we do, we should not forget that all of us are human and human connection and attention to the students in the classroom is paramount. So thank you very much for this question, Mohammed, because I can see that you're worried that uh, students should be feeling the attention of the teacher and should be understood of the teacher. I think definitely this question is coming from the right place. All right, the next question is how to make teaching online engaging for students all the time. That's interesting. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I think it's all about picking up on what's not working. You know, just like Catherine says, uh, it is very, very possible to pick up on these emotions or these little uh, cues that students give you. And sometimes, you know, it's just what they say or what they do, or maybe they're just staring at one corner of the screen and, you know, holding their hands like this. And that's a cue that tells you they're not interested or they're busy with someone else. And that's your cue to change what you're doing, perhaps, you know, try something else. Um, the exciting part is, you know, you have access to the Internet when you're on the computer as a teacher. You don't have to shuffle through your notes to look for something else. You know, you can just do all tab, move to another browser, look for something interesting and change the activity. It's our little secret, but it works. If they can shift, we can shift too. And why not, you know, if it's going to help them. So I'd say make the most of that online environment. Absolutely. If I could add something to this, Ash, I mm -hmm. was actually thinking that there's a session after hours about teaching very young learners and young learners. And one thing I know from teaching young learners is that it's very important to use stirrers and settlers to alternate between activities that stir up the energy and then calm people down. It's very much applied to online learning and teaching as well. So when I said, I don't know how to make teaching online engaging all the time, it's absolutely true. It's not possible. You can stir people up and you can get a lot of energy in the classroom, but then you need people to be a bit less engaged for some time and it's okay. It's perfectly fine. So it's good for the teacher to be able to acknowledge that and give, you know, some kind of eyes down task when students can make some notes, think about their next answer quietly, and then you stir up the energy again and you see them engaged all the time. Then your 55 or 60 minute classes will seem like 30 minute classes because they will have this little energy flow. All right. Shall I take the next one? The tips to offer um, to make 
online classes more effective from Dr. Haribabu Tamineni. I hope hmm. we've, we've actually answered all of that, which yeah. the tips that we've given so far. Is there anything to add from your side, Ash? Mm, no, not really. I hope we've given you enough to move forward. And you're welcome to connect with us at any time if you, you know, try something out and it doesn't work and you'd like some suggestions. So please do connect. I would just add one more thing that um, goes well with what Ash has said. It's good that you're here already. If you're an aspiring online teacher and you're thinking about how to make online classes more effective, you've made the first step. So reflect on what you've heard here and what you're doing in the classroom. And when you start reflecting and trying to understand what has happened and how to improve it, that is the best tip that we could give you. I'm going to skip the uh, two questions because Eric has answered for us. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. And we move to another one which says, how do we gauge the learning from online teaching or the online teaching and learning process? That's completely up your alley, Kat. So I'm going to hand that to you. <laughs> All right. And actually the next one, if we have the time for it, would be about content. Great choice. Oh. <laughs> so um, actually measuring learning results is one of very, very big problems in education. It's not difficult to measure everything that we do and everything that we feel in the classroom. So in order to have an idea of what is happening, we need to triangulate our evidence, if you like. We need to look at different sources of feedback say what we do for example we observe classes we'll look at the teacher's behavior we'll look at the student's behavior we'll look at how engaged students are we'll look at how interested the students are in what is happening we also look at how the student's skills change from the beginning to the end of the class if the class actually gave them some good information that they can use if the class has helped them develop their skills so observations is one way. Another way is to look at the students perceptions of their success. So, for example, in our situation, we can get live feedback and star ratings for every class that the teacher does. And if a student adds a verbal comment to this star that they give us, we can understand what worked in this class, what didn't, what they have learned, what they need more practice with. Another way is, of course, to solicit feedback. So a typical way would be to have surveys and focus group with students. We can have a lot of information coming from the learners themselves. Finally, there are exams, assessments, reports, and I'm sure there will be some talks uh, today or maybe in some other events where you can find out more about how assessment works at the British Council and elsewhere. All of this should and could be put together to have a more holistic picture of how a learner develops. You cannot use just one of those factors and understand if the learning happens or not. You look at it from an academic manager's perspective, from the teacher's perspective, from the student's perspective, and also look at the test results. Okay, over to you, Ash, if we have a bit of time. I think we have just one minute, so one last question, I'm assuming. As online content creators, can you give me some advice if I'm self-studying a topic? For example, I'd like some tips about structuring, setting my goals, and finding resources about different topics. If you're self-studying, that's very interesting. I think first you need to understand what you know already. You know, that's a good starting point. There's no point starting from scratch if you have X amount of knowledge. So work out what you already know and then build on that knowledge. Find out what uh, course or what application or what material can help you, you know, move ahead. Uh, when you have that knowledge, yes, reading and listening and, you know, accessing res a, a range of resources, you know, it could be magazines, it could be an article online, it could be something on Reddit, you know, where you can get information about that topic. And then as you move ahead, you know what you don't know and what you want to know more about. So that should be your next step. Uh, 
that's when you know I need to know more about this. I can do this by reading some more or maybe interacting with a professional. You know, that's when you decide whether you need a life class, for example, or maybe just a one to one with someone who's an expert. And then, of course, there's a follow up uh, where you decide how much more you need to do. And that's something like the flip learning that we were talking about. You know, it, it ties in well with that concept of learning and learning online and helping you learn how to learn and not just learn what you're trying to learn. I hope that answers your question in a nutshell. Um, we have, it's 9.41. Do we have time for another question? I have no idea. Okay, we'll, we'll take one until they tell us to stop, I think, Catherine. What do you think? <laughs> All right, let's take one more. Because <laughs> it's quite nice. I'm looking at Vino's question. Um, have you got any advice for on for one-to-one -one online learning in terms of how to make it engaging? One-to-one -one online classes are amazing. I love them the most because that's a unique opportunity for you to get in touch with a person, maybe on the other side of the world, and you can really, really understand what they need and how you can help them. You cannot achieve the same in a short group class. It's just the way things work. So I would say enjoy one-to-one -one classes, first of all see them as very valuable either from the student or from the teacher's perspective and try to use as many ways as you can to personalize the learning for them you need to have a needs analysis with that student you need to build the course that answers their need and then everything else is secondary to, to my in, in my opinion you can use all kinds of activities but as long as they're relevant to the person you're teaching, everything will go really well. So to recap, show a genuine interest in that person. Understand that an online class one-to-one -one, gives you unique opportunities to do exactly what your student needs, and then talk to them, find out what they need and go from there. One more? I think. That's it. Nasa has mentioned. Ah, uh, let's look at the chat. <laughs> yes, session closing shortly. It's been lovely uh, connecting with all of you. We can't see you, but we know you're there. We hope you've enjoyed the session as much as we have enjoyed presenting it to you. Uh, there's going to be some feedback that pops up. Please remember to give us some feedback and stay tuned for the next session, as Katrin said. <laughs>